Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, great to see you here uh, on this Easter uh, Sunday morning. Uh, please keep your Bibles open there. Uh, let me commit our time to God once again uh, through prayer, and then we'll look at this part of God's Word together. Please join me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your words to us here. Uh, we thank you that through your words here that we can have certain hope in you. Uh, we thank you for Jesus who died for us and is risen now uh, to reign. And uh, We pray that as we listen to your words now that you may steal our minds and our hearts. And please prepare us that we may have eyes to see what you would have us see, uh, ears to listen to you, and hearts ready to obey what you would have us obey. And pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, Chris Harrison uh, was a tw- uh, is a 12-year-old, uh, was a 12-year-old, he's no longer 12. He was playing cricket at the time, and when a bowler pitched the ball, it went straight into his heart. He, was, he walked about 15 steps, and then he collapsed with sharp chest pain. Uh, it was his first heart attack. But he woke up. You know, he woke up, and uh, he was actually okay at the time, and then he got brought to the Royal North Shore Hospital, and he was fine. But then half an hour later, he collapsed again. But this time, he needed resuscitation. And according to the doctors, he was dead for two minutes. But he was revived, and he lives to tell the tale. You can search up that story online. On this topic, I thought I'd continue to search up. Well, are there more stories out there of people who were declared dead, clinically dead, uh, but then they were resuscitated? And so I searched it up, and here are some quotes that I came across. Uh, Two. Uh, First one, I've died once. I don't remember much except there was a nice, dark nothingness, which I guess felt kind of cozy, but I also knew it was the end, so I'd better not. I don't know. I knew I wasn't supposed to go into the dark. Like, I was in the dark, but I wasn't supposed to be enjoying it, because if I embraced it too much, I would die. Here's another one. They told me I was dead for three minutes. I remember those clips of people saying they experienced some kind of near afterlife. But for me, it was like sleeping. I woke up. They told me how I almost died. I said, oh, yeah? They explained a bunch of stuff and then offered me grilled cheese. Uh, I don't know about you, but I find these accounts fascinating. You know, my initial instinct is to be skeptical. I'm like, whoa, like, did this really happen? How did it happen? But at the same time, these are accounts. These are people recalling what has happened, and they're passing it on. They're sharing with us their experience of what happened for them. They can't recreate this. It's not like we can ask these people to die again to prove it. That would be too risky and unethical. But this is what happened, and this is them sharing their story with us. Now, let's cast our minds back to Jesus' time over 2,000 years ago. He died... And he stayed clinically dead. And that was from Friday through to Sunday, three days inclusive. That's very different to three minutes. You know, we're talking three days here. Now, what do you do with that? I wonder if you're skeptical like me. This is an account of what happened. This is written by Luke, who did the research. He was a doctor by background, thoroughly researched over time trustworthy, accurate account. He captures it for us now to hear this and to digest and work out what to do with it. Three minutes, yes, but three days, inclusive. Luke's aim is not to explain how this happened. That's not what he's trying to do. He merely records the facts for us so that we can decide what to do. And so what we're going to do is look at the facts. We're going to look at what happened What happened on that very first Easter Sunday? Look at why it happened, and then we'll think through, well, what does this have anything to do with us? Uh, Because it just might change your mind. But just to go there, just to start off with, well, how does this have anything to do with me? There's actually a lot. Have you ever wondered why Christians are confident that there's life after death? You may not think about that often, but Christians are confident that there's life after death. Why is that? We say we believe in a heaven and hell, but why? Why can we be confident that it's true? It comes back to Jesus rising from the dead. He is living proof that there is life after death. He is living proof that God's word does come true. 
wouldn't you want to listen to someone who's actually come back from the dead? You'd listen to him, wouldn't you, if on the subject of death? He's the expert. He came back from the dead. Wouldn't you trust him even more if everything he said up until this point has come true? His track record is 100%. Jesus is trustworthy. And Jesus rising from the dead has everything to do with us because God is real. We will all die one day, whether we like it or not. And God promises that we too will rise from the dead. Jesus is living proof. Now, if you're sitting there and you're wondering, like, this is a little bit hard to understand, a little bit hard to believe, don't worry. That was how people have reacted, even back then, on that very first Easter Sunday. That's how people have reacted throughout the ages, and that's, I expect that's what's going to happen to some of us today as well. So let's slow down. We'll look at the passage, and we'll look at why this is actually understandable and why this is actually believable. And so have a look there. Look back at the passage, Luke chapter 24. They found it hard to understand as well. Why did Jesus rise from the dead? Look with me here. I'll read it out to us again. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee? The Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. See, they didn't understand what was going on here. The women, they came to the tomb to pay their respects, but it all came as a shock. Just think about it for a moment. If you were to take flowers to the cemetery, do you expect an empty grave? It'd be very unlikely, right? If that happened to me, my first thought would be someone here is playing a really, really dark and unhelpful prank. Like, Why is the body missing? Same thing here. Why isn't the body here? My last thought would be, this person has come back to life. That doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. But it happens here. They come to the tomb. It's not a grave in the ground, by the way. Uh, it's, back then, the tombs, it was like a, a rock, uh, with uh, kind of like a, a, an opening in a mountain, and a big rock like we saw over there, actually really helpfully displayed for us. Only the wealthy people uh, could be buried in these places. And in the other accounts we read, Joseph of Arimathea was the person who took down Jesus' body, and presumably he was wealthy. He was a respected man of the council. He had the money. And so he put Jesus in that kind of tomb to pay Jesus' respect and honor. And when the women arrived, to their surprise, the stones rolled away. Jesus isn't there. And who's there instead? Look again. There's these two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning. It, it would have been bright. Two men in bright clothes. And if you recall from the other accounts, this is really fascinating, Mark's account says that there's a young man there. Matthew's account says that there's an angel there. John's account says that there's two angels in white. Luke's account, which is what we have here, we have two men in bright clothes. You might think that, well, what's going on there? Why are there different details? How does this all match up? Either way, the big point here is Jesus rose from the dead. Here's how I like to kind of approach this. If, in case someone asks you why are the details different, here's why. Think of it this way. You and three friends, you, you're standing around one day, you're having a meal, you're catching up for old time's sake. You're thinking back to 20 years ago. 20 years ago, you were playing soccer on a field. There was a big fire in the neighborhood, and there were some fire trucks that drove by. One of you remembers that there was one fire truck. Another one of you remembers that there were three fire trucks. And another one of you remembers that there were four fire trucks. And it just happens to be while you're sitting around now, you're, you're thinking back to that day, you're, I don't know, telling old stories, cracking some jokes, and you're thinking back, well, actually, how many fire trucks were there that day? 
One of you says, oh, I'm pretty sure there was one. Pretty sure there was three. Actually, I think there was two. There was two. They're the details. The big point is there was a fire on that day, and there were fire trucks on that day. It actually adds credibility to the story. There was actually a fire. Sure, the details are slightly different because everyone has a slightly different memory and a slightly different experience, but it happened. And so when we come back here, the big point is the tomb was empty. That's the consistent thing across all the accounts. The tomb was empty. There was someone there to share this message. That's the big point. But what was that message? Verse 7. Jesus is risen from the dead. The Son of Man is risen. He must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Jesus said it would happen. He's told them at least three times. And now it has. This Son of Man is Jesus talking about himself. He was crucified, as we heard, on Friday. And on the third day, uh, do the math, so Friday, Saturday, Sunday, the third day, first, second, third, third day inclusive, he's raised to new life. It even says here, he must be delivered. It was necessary for this to happen. It was part of God's plan. It had to happen so that God could save sinners like you and I. But death is not the end of Jesus. He rises from the dead on the third day. And now God has said it would happen, Jesus said it would happen, and now it comes true. Don't you understand? God's word comes true. Jesus is alive and he is powerful over death. Now, that is extraordinary. Don't get me wrong. Again, I'm skeptical. I'm sure you are. How could anyone believe that? Three minutes, yes. But three days? We find it hard to believe. But again, you might be surprised to find this out, but even they found it hard to believe. Look again in the next part with me. These are the apostles, those who were the first eyewitnesses. They spent time with Jesus, and they found it hard to believe. Verse 9 here. When they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the others with them who told this to the apostles. But they did not believe the women, because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. Bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves, and he went away, wondering to himself what had happened. The women, they see the empty tomb, and they go back to report to the apostles. And remember, these are the apostles. They spent time with Jesus, these 11 and the others. They ate with Jesus. They traveled with Jesus. They saw his miracles. They heard his teachings. They were with him in the flesh. They heard his predictions. Jesus said that he would rise from the dead. Yet here they are, verse 11, their first instinct, they did not believe. You'd expect them to believe, wouldn't you? you know, if this was a fake account, let's just, you know, for argument's sake, say this was a fake account wanting to brainwash us, wouldn't this leave out that fact? Wouldn't it say something like, the apostles, they believed straight away. This was all good news. But that's not what happens. Luke, he keeps this fact here because he's concerned about the truth. He wants to report what actually happened. He keeps the detail in there. And this is what happens. You can be certain of it. These are those who are closest to Jesus, and even they didn't believe that he rose from the dead. It is that extraordinary. And here's the thing. As this news starts to spread, and it continues to spread across the ancient world, other people also respond in the same way. Not everyone believes. People reject this message. They're like, what? Like, as if you're, you're out of your mind. This is how people responded to the news back then. Look with me at Acts 17. It should be on the screen. Verse 31. Just, look, just notice there's three different ways that people respond to Jesus and his resurrection here. Verse 31. 
For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. When they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered. But others said, we want to hear you again on this subject. At that, Paul left the council. Some of the people became followers of Paul and believed. You know, there's three responses there. And we are not so different to them back then. People will respond to Jesus and his resurrection in three different ways. It's the same back then as it is now. The first one here is people sneer at him. You know, they mock him. I've, I've met with people who mock Jesus. People who are close to me. They just won't have a bar of Jesus. You're out of your mind. You're crazy. He can't save himself. Why should I follow him? There are those who will be curious. I'm just going to keep coming. I want to find out more. Actually, this is kind of interesting. You know, I'm going to read some books. More. I'm going to find out a bit more about Jesus. I might even check out church. I might even be open to reading the Bible. I'm curious. Let's find out more. And then there are those who follow. You know, our church family here, we love Jesus. We accept Jesus. We want to follow Jesus. That is our, our desire, our devotion, our conviction. Luke knows that we're skeptical. Even the apostles didn't believe. But he gives us the facts so that we can make up our own minds about Jesus. Just remember, he is th- he's thoroughly researched this topic. Over the trustworthy and accurate accounts that he's given us here. And just like them, we'll find it hard to understand and we'll find it hard to believe that Jesus truly rose from the dead. Now, we've looked at what happened. You might still be making up your mind about that. But just on that topic, let's go into why Jesus rises from the dead. Why why would God do this? Why does he raise Jesus from the dead? What's the point? Why is this believable? Why is Easter good news for us? We're actually already given a clue here in Acts 17. Let's look there again. Jesus rising from the dead is living proof in many different ways. We'll just look at one. But many different ways. From verse 31, he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. Just notice the word proof there. Jesus rising from the dead proves something. That's helpful. The Apostle Paul says here, the fact that Jesus rose from the dead is living proof that he will come back to judge the world. Now that's a lot to take in. Ponder that for a moment. If Jesus rose from the dead, that means he is alive. Right now. If he is alive, that means he has kept his promise. He promised, he, he's, told us, he's told his disciples that he would rise from the dead. He kept his word. Which means, if he's kept his word, he will keep his word. Present tense. He says he will return to judge. Matthew's gospel. He will come back to judge. He will separate the sheep and the goats. He will separate humanity into two camps. He will keep his word. In other words... This means God's word is true. The fact that Jesus rises from the dead is proof that God keeps his word and that God, he has kept it and he will keep it. In other words, his track record is 100%. If I made you a promise, you would trust me if I kept it, wouldn't you? We can trust God. We can be certain that his words are true. He hasn't failed yet. He hasn't disappointed once. How do we know that? Look back at Jesus. He is living proof that God keeps his word. Now that's massive. Implications. God's word is true. There's lots of things that God's word says. Here here are just a few. When he says he loves us, he means it. When he says we are forgiven of our sins, 
we truly are. When he says he will return one day, we can trust him. The promises of the gospel will be kept. As Proverbs says, every word of the Lord proves true. The proof of that is Jesus rising from the dead. It comes back to him. If you want confidence in the promises of the gospel, look at Jesus. He's the first one to rise from the dead. And there's more. We're actually told in other parts of Scripture. We'll actually all rise from the dead one day. Again, mind-boggling. Is that believable? Jesus himself proves to us that there is life after death. And he tells us we will all rise into eternal death or eternal life. We are one or the other. Do I believe that straight up? No, I don't, actually. I used to be skeptical. I'm still skeptical by nature. But I'm persuaded by looking at Jesus and the historical evidence there. If you can disprove him and his resurrection from the dead, I will listen. It sounds crazy. But this is believable. This is actually true. These are the promises that God would have us believe. And again, just here's some more reasons for why is this believable? Why is this so amazing? Here are two, two reasons just for you to consider again. We can trust Luke. Luke has done the work. Remember, he has labored over this. He's a smart guy. He's put in the effort and the time. He has organized this all for our benefit. He's done interviews. He's talked to the first eyewitnesses. He stresses that these are the first eyewitnesses so that we won't ignore this account. Don't ignore it, is what Luke is saying to us. Don't ignore what you see here. Don't ignore Jesus or the promises of the gospel. They are true. Don't wait until it's too late to find out. And here's the thing. It wasn't just Luke. There were actually many more people that believed that Jesus rose from the dead. Here are some. Thomas. Uh, He's not the most well-known apostle uh, or disciple. He doubted Jesus. When Jesus first rose from the dead, Thomas was like, I don't believe you. I won't believe you unless I can you know, put my hands in the holes in your hands, unless I can poke your side where you were speared, I will not believe. In the end, he changes. He completely gets transformed. He believes. He goes, my Lord and my God. How do you explain that? James, the brother of Jesus, he initially thinks that Jesus is crazy. He's like, this guy, he's out of his mind. That's when Jesus was alive. And later on, complete transformation. He he completely changes. He gives his life to serving Jesus, leading the church. And he writes this letter. uh, You'll find it in the New Testament, the book of James, to the 12 tribes in the dispersion. He's a leader of these various different churches uh, across the ancient world. He gives his life to serving Jesus and the church. Why? And there's more. Peter, he was just a fisherman. He follows Jesus, he denies Jesus, and then he follows Jesus again. He leads the church, and eventually he dies for the sake of Jesus. And when he's crucified, he gets crucified upside down because he says he is not worthy to die the same death as his Savior. How do you explain Peter's transformation? And there's more. Paul We have his accounts of what his life was like before he followed Jesus. In the book of Acts, this man killed Christians. He persecuted the church. But he meets Jesus and he does a complete 180, complete transformation. And he spends the rest of his life telling people about the good news that Jesus rose from the dead and we are forgiven. And here's the last one. It wasn't just them. There were also over 500 people, over 500 brothers and sisters who testify that Jesus is risen from the dead. That's in 1 Corinthians here. You'll see here. This is the Apostle Paul writing, and he's trying to persuade us why the resurrection is trustworthy. This is the Apostle Paul. Verse 3, For what I received I passed on to you as of first importance. 
that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, that's Peter, and then to the Twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. Paul, he's saying to them, these people are still alive. He's stressing that fact. These are the eyewitnesses. They were there. They saw Jesus when he rose from the dead and he stayed around for 40 days to tell people about the kingdom of God. You can check it out. You can verify the facts. You can go talk to them. They're still alive. Some are dead, but the majority of them are still alive. Check it out for yourself. And not only that, it isn't just them. Look at the 2,000 years. People have given their lives to serving Jesus. The church has been preserved throughout the ages. This message has only grown and spread right across the world to the ends of the earth, right down to us. People have died for Jesus. People have given their lives to serving Jesus. How do you explain all that? Why? Why have people have done that? I can only come to the conclusion after looking into all this that they were convinced, as I am, that Jesus rose from the dead. He is risen. The promises of the gospel are true. God is real. There is life after death. The living proof is Jesus. And again, that's a lot to take in. You know, are you... We're all at different kind of points in our walk in finding out about Jesus here. We have some new people visiting us. Welcome. Great to have you with us. We have our regular people at church here who are persuaded of the truth. Whichever one you are, here are the truths that we're we're wrestling with here. God is real. Jesus is real. God's word is true. One day, Jesus will return to judge the world. That has everything to do with you and I. Because he will judge you and he will judge me. We will have to give an account to God one day for our lives. And so the question is, well, what will you do about it? If you were here on Friday, I shared about my friend Johnny. Uh, If you weren't here, uh, the story, the short story is, uh, he's a friend of mine that uh, we used to work together. Um, when we were both uh, physios, uh, physiotherapists. Uh, In January, I found out that he drowned. Uh, He gave his life uh, to rescuing uh, this child that was in trouble while he was on holidays in New Zealand with his fiancée. It's it's a terrible situation. If you and I, or if you or I, were that child or that child's family, wouldn't you be forever grateful for what Johnny has done? How can we even begin to repay that debt? What can we even do in response to his death for us? Wouldn't it be rude of me to ignore Johnny's family? Wouldn't it be rude to not go to the funeral? Wouldn't it be terrible of me if I, at the very least, did not say how sorry I am for what has happened and ask for forgiveness. Wouldn't that be terrible? Now, wouldn't it be awesome news if he came back to life? If he came back to life, remember, if you are the child or the child's family, we can begin to say thank you. Thank you. We can begin to ask, well, what would you have me do because of what you've done for me? We can begin to say, my life is now yours. I'm here to serve you. I'm here to follow you because of what you have done for me. My debt is to you. My life is indebted to you for what you have done for me. It's similar with Jesus. Jesus is risen. He is 
risen. He has given his life to save us. He has rescued us. He's proven to us how much he loves us. And we are indebted to him. And so for the Christians, we, we serve him with our whole lives. We serve him as our Lord and as our Savior for what he has done. And if you're here and you're trying to make up your mind about Jesus, about the Bible, about Christianity, God extends his hand to you to rescue you. The question is, will you accept it? He can't make you. We can't force you. That's not our job. It's your response. And so will you accept it? Will you accept Jesus into your life? Will you accept the promises of the gospel? Will you accept that they are true? And if he saved you, the next step is, well, will you follow him in return? He's risen. We can say thank you. We can follow him. We're indebted to him. Will you follow him? Will you live his way instead of your own way? Luke is impressing upon us. Don't ignore him any longer. Don't ignore the facts any longer. There are many. Jesus is real. God's word is true. And you have a choice to receive Jesus as your Savior and live with him as your Lord or reject Jesus and never look back. I'm not trying to oversimplify, but those are the two options at the end of the day. Even if, if in the middle, you're like, I'm, I'm not sure, well, that's probably a no for now. You know when people try to say no to you and they're not sure, well, it's actually a no at the time. There's actually only two responses that, here. We either receive Jesus or we reject Jesus. But be certain of this. Jesus will come back to judge the world. He is risen from the dead. He is living proof that God's word is true that God loves us, that God forgives us, and God accepts us as we are. So what will you do about it? My prayer and my hope is that we would all receive Jesus, or at the very least, find out more about Jesus. Be curious. Find out more. We're here to serve you. We would love to talk to you. We would love to read the Bible with you so that you can make up your mind and be certain, as we are certain, of the hope, of the good news that we are forgiven and Jesus is risen from the dead. Please join me as I pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that every word that you give us in Scripture is true. We thank you that you have revealed yourself to us in Jesus. We thank you that he has risen from the dead and that he is proof that you are real and that you will come back. Father, thank you for so many people here who are visiting or checking us out for the first time. Uh, Please help them uh, to make up their minds about you, whether to accept you or to reject you. Please give them clarity. We pray that we as a church family as well will love and serve one another and serve uh, our visitors and our guests. Uh, Help us as a church uh, to keep remembering the good news of Jesus, uh, to keep loving and serving you with our whole lives and to keep sharing the good news uh, with all that you put before us. Thank you, Father, that Jesus is risen, and he's risen indeed. In Jesus' name we pray all these things. Amen.